at some point I'll, I'll introduce myself to you, um, but I wanna make sure that uh, we give um, other folks some time to get in here, um, you know, from the other session. So good morning again, I'm Steven. Currently Mr. Newbold, soon to be Dr. Newbold at some point um, <laughs> in life. <laughs> I'm still working hard on um, this, but um, it's a rewarding experience. And I'm not talking about quitting this week, so that's good too. <laughs> Okay, it's 11.15, I think we can start. Thank you, thank you. So as an educator, I always said to myself, I need an assistant. So I found a way to be in two places at one time as a teacher. I typically film myself doing the lesson. So if the students need help, I can walk around and there's two of me there. We can stop and rewind. I didn't understand, let me rewind. <laughs> and then I'm gonna work with this student. So I um, did film the first part of, um, I just did it a, a little while ago, the first part of this talk, um, just so that we could stay on track with time. But it is an, a participatory experience. So you guys will be working together on this experience today. So um, I won't be doing too much talking. Thank you, Bree. Okay, so let's see if we can, let's see if this works. Share screen, we're gonna share. Okay. What if I was black in America? Take a moment and jot down your initial reaction to this prompt. What if you were black in America? A lot of us here today are actually black or identify with being black. But if you don't, still humor me and answer the prompt. Write it in the chat. Dina says complex identities. Anti-Blackness ain't beautiful. A participatory approach to analyzing artwork of the Black experience. The primary focus of today's participatory experience is to dismantle anti-Blackness when engaging with visuals depicting an array of the Black experience. Many school districts across the country, including DCPS, have introduced frameworks for equity that call anti-racist educators to action. The current state of K through 12 art education requires a recalibrating of the parameters of both public pedagogy and curriculum themes, said Dr. James Rollins, Jr. Anti-Blackness ain't beautiful in art crit critiques, disrupts conscious and unconscious biases rooted in white supremacy while anti-Black biases rooted in white supremacy while critiquing art. So the participatory encounters that this closed study protocol employees go from an initial reaction to an analysis of intent and inference. So just a little bit about myself. My name is Mr. Stephen C. Nubo Jr. I am a DCPS teacher of six years now. Um, I have 15 years of K through 12 teaching experience under my belt. 
and I'm currently a PhD student in the Department of Art Education at Florida State University. My dissertation topic is the Black Male Educator's Experience, Self-Care, Resilience, Recruitment, and Retention. So why are we here today? We are here to answer the call for an anti-racist approach to our education with a specific integration of anti-Blackness. By using an approach to art criticism designed to address microaggressions, racial battle fatigue, and to celebrate Black life from a non-deficit lens. My fourth grade teacher, Ms. Diane Carter-Williams always said, Black is beautiful, but ugly is to the bone. As a kid, I would always ask myself, what is she talking about? But now as an adult and a future PhD, um, I can relate exactly to what she's saying. Being black is not an insult. Being black is not a hindrance. Being black could be looked at as these things, but we as educators need to teach our children and all children that being Black is beautiful. But the ugliness of racism, microaggressions, are all ugly to the bone. Using philosophy to understand challenges, institutional deficiencies, or even why a call for action to value Black life is necessary. As communities of color across the nation join with allies to resist the systemic racism that violently impacts the daily lives of those we are entrusted to teach and protect, says Dr. James H. Rowling, Jr. of the National Art Education Association. He is committed in an effort to illuminate the necessity of greater equity, diversity, and inclusion, so much so that he wrote an open letter about how Black lives matter in our education. In this open letter, he frames interventions. There's four different categories. First, altering parameters, altering feedback, altering design and altering intent. All right, I think we'll go live now. So I'll stop sharing my screen, stop sharing. Are you guys with me? I'm not boring you. Okay, all right, okay, cool. Good, good, good. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen again. Where's share? We'll go to the PowerPoint. So Dr. Rawlings, he, he framed his open letter into four different categories. So um, I'm not going to go through all 12 interventions, but I'll take one intervention um, per category. So we'll start off with, and let me let me get on presenter. Play from current slide. Okay. So we'll start with constants. So as our educators or as educators, period, we have the ability to go and do all the work before we take it to our students. So if we present constants to our students, like viewing artwork created of and by black students, uh, black people, then this becomes a norm and it disrupts the status quo. So I have, I'm going to go through the slides and show you just a few um, artists that you can use um, and introduce to your students um, in this critique process. Again, today, when we break off into breakout groups, I have um, three different pieces that 
I want you guys to look at and each breakout group would use one and we'll engage in the closed study process. But here may Weems, artist. Um, here's another artist um, that we use in DCPS to explore themes of identity through storytelling and self exploration. As a middle school student, as a middle school teacher, excuse me, I find that the students, um, for lack of a better term, are self centered. So, you know, when you give them a project that allows them to be self reflective, they're going to thrive and they're going to want to share with you who they are. So that initial prompt that I heard earlier, when I asked you to tell me in the chat um, if, if you were Black in America, dot, 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 um, think about some, some prompts such as those to get the students' minds going before you introduce heavy content to them. That, if I was Black in America, may have been heavy, maybe, but I didn't look at it as heavy. That's why my comment in the chat was, I will be lit. Um, that's a term that my students might use. For me, I love being Black. I'm happy to be Black. Somebody else might look at it you know, as a deficit, but um, personally, there are challenges that are associated with my race and even my gender as an educator in a public school system, but that's not what I lead with. So if I'm able to frame the lesson for the students where they're able to not only take the negative that maybe society has um, said about a particular group of people, but also to throughout the great parts. Amy Sherrill, you might know her. Um, she's acclaimed for the portrait of First Lady Michelle Obama. That's in the National Portrait Gallery um, here in Washington, DC. I believe it's probably going on tour soon. So if you haven't seen it, um, go look it up on the internet. Um, another artist here, Titus Kafar. Kende Wiley, another artist that you may know who did the um, portrait of um, President Barack Obama that was also housed in the National Portrait Gallery. Um, he and also Amy Sherald are two of the artists that we're going to do our um, close study on today. Let me see. Um, do Gordon Parks. I have some art of Gordon Parks um, up in my house right now. Um, he's like one of my, my spirit people who I tap into um, as an artist and educator. So Rollins says, remember, systems resist change. So how can we as educators um, change things that don't want to be changed, okay? So I think it's time to go into our breakout groups. But before we go into our breakout groups, I am going to introduce to you the closed study protocol. DCPS has this closed study protocol. It's the five encounters of closed study. The first encounter is what is your initial reaction or general understanding of the image, whether it's a photograph, whether it's a painting, whether it's a sculpture. When you look at it, anything that you think of, what you see, what you think, what you wonder about the piece. That's your initial reaction. There's no wrong answer for this. It's just what you think. I want you guys, uh, when you get into your breakout groups to engage in encounter one and also encounter two. Encounter two um, goes a little deeper than just your initial reaction. You're looking at the piece and you're gathering key details from the piece. So you're looking for visual evidence and you're not necessarily coming up with the conclusion from the visual evidence, but when we come back into um, a large group, then we'll go to the next phases of the closed encounter. So I am going, we're gonna drop the, um, the, the breakout group information in the chat. It has the encounters already on the slide. So if you need to refer to it, you will have that and you'll have um, the images. Um, this is for one breakout group. This is for the second one. And this is the image that we're going to 
um, do um, the close study encounter on the third one. Everybody has access to edit directly on the document. So if you wanted to annotate directly on the picture by adding your comments, you can do so. So instead of writing it down, you can, you can type it directly on the computer if you have access. So Kimberly, are we ready to, to break everybody out? Yes, I'm looking at time. Are you still good for us to do 15 minutes? Let's do 10. Okay. You should be getting an invitation to join your breakout room shortly. Room. Hey y'all, welcome back. Do we have everybody back? Okay, so how was that? The floor is open to share your thoughts, share your initial reactions. Um, you can tell me which piece um, your group talked about. Maybe they talked about all of them. Um, the floor is open now. For me, um, this is definitely big. One of the things that I actually recently just talked about with my students was um, the excessive um, view of Black pain and Black struggle that's constantly shown, whether it's in artwork, whether it's an image, and, and them being like so desensitized to that negativity. And so seeing this kind of positive artwork, um, I'm not an art teacher, I'm a history teacher, but uh, I came to this session because we have a unit coming up where they will be doing a paideia seminar on Black consciousness with Steve Biko and Black is Beautiful. And I was like, this would be the perfect accompaniment to that to add into the curriculum to kind of help them see that because they're always taught about the struggle of people of color. But a lot of times uh, that what we try to do is focus on that celebration, but you know, I don't think art is utilized enough in other subjects. So I think this was definitely important. And definitely, um, I feel like the artwork was um, powerful. Sorry, you can't see me. I have a touchscreen computer and I'm still getting used to it. Um, <laughs> but even just um, the Mary Parker and uh, Kayla Cowan picture, but that two sisters picture definitely, definitely um, resonated with me. Um, I'm a twin, so it absolutely resonated with me for sure. But just the artwork, how much it like stuck out, it's just, just beautiful. So this was definitely great for me. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that, Adrian. I think that's one of the things I teach elementary school and I teach elementary school art. So I only have the kids once a week for 40 minutes. Um, so trying to do honor to things um, in 40 minutes when I'm touching on different cultures is definitely a challenge. Um, um, but also trying to find positive imagery. It's something that my school district has worked really hard to make sure that we have broader representation in our literature. We have a pretty culturally diverse school. Um, it is suburban, so it's you know definitely something that we have to deal with a lot of tensions um, that occasionally come up unexpectedly. Um, but trying to find imagery that I could share with the kids on a regular basis whether it's in a casual setting that I just have that represented or we're doing a specific lesson on it, it has been really important. So it's great to see these artists that I can can work with because in 40 minutes, I can't unpack some of the more challenging imagery. Jennifer, I'm glad you said the, the time constraints because there's five encounters to close study, but I, we didn't have to do all five of them today you know, starting with the one and then maybe going into a making session, but it's like, remember what we talked about, you know, last time, and then you can bring it back up later, but it's, it's not always gift wrapped beautifully for you, but we could adjust and still make it happen. So thank you. Would anybody else want to um, share? I have some books. I have this book, um, Racial Microaggressions, Using Critical Race Theory to Respond to Everyday Racism. This is a really good one. I've been reading this. Um, I also have um, here, let's see, Black is Beautiful, um, a philosophy on the Black aesthetic. Um, I've been able to uh, pull out some jewels here and also have um, 
cultural diversity in education, James Banks. Um, for me, culturally responsive teaching practices don't seem, it doesn't seem like university programs are making it um, mandatory for educators to be culturally responsive. It's almost like it's an option. Um, when I did my master's program, there was an option to take a culturally responsive pedagogy class, but when you have a group of people in the program that if I don't have to take it, then I don't learn about that. That's not something that I'm going to pour out into my students and be conscious about because the um, makers of the curriculum didn't say it was important and they didn't make it a part of the curriculum. So my value or their value for it is not as strong. And that's a problem. Um, that's something that I've been vocal about too um, at my university, like this needs to be a part. We're not only teaching one type of child. And if we're going to throw out these terms of teaching the whole child and holistic learning, then culturally responsive pedagogy is a part of that. All right, let's hang on. Anybody else? I'm so interested in what you have to say. And it'll give me guidance on how to move forward with this, this protocol, because like I said, I'm, I'm, I've adapted what DCPS um, has presented with the five encounters, but for structure three of the encounter, it says at this stage, students should be forming interpretation of the work. This encounter asks them to dig deeper into understanding how the underlying structures support those interpretation. But some students aren't, their deep isn't towards anti-racist um, pedagogy. Their deep isn't towards dismantling anti-Blackness. So we as educators have to insert that piece in order, in order to answer that call that Dr. Rawlings um, wrote in his open um in, in his paper. So that's my TED talk. And um thank you for having me guys. Thank you. I really hope it was valuable to everybody. It was fun. Thank you.